I'll gladly talk about that in the question period. But I want to leave with this, with the, the situation that young people face. And I am not a pessimist by nature. I am super optimistic even when I have no right to be. I just, just the way I am. You know, I, 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 everything in my life I love. I, I enjoy every, every minute of it, except for the kid with the broken glass thing. And that, I'll admit, that was a bit of a drag. <laughs> I'm worried about that. But, but, it, but even then, even then, I was able to call up physician friends of mine, some of whom I knew in college, but also when people I've met at events like this, who now I have a physician friend who said to me, you know, I've read your books and they've benefited me, so if you ever need some medical advice, and so I called them up and said, guess what? <laughs> so it, that, was, that was wonderful. But anyway, but it, it does, this does need to be known, because here's the great, greatest myth of all, that, that people have misled themselves into thinking that, if, again, if something is desirable, all we need to do is demand it, resources are unlimited, Taxation can always get us whatever we want because there are always enough rich suckers to be expropriated. Well, it turns out we are living through the disproof of that notion. Because we are about to, it's, it's, okay, so we know that the national debt, you know, $14 trillion, is really high, how are we going to pay? But what are we going to do about Social Security and Medicare? Mostly Medicare, which right now, the present, the present value of the unfunded liability there is $111 trillion. Now that's really, that's going to be a little bit of a pain to try and pay. Uh, especially when we consider that the Republicans are going to sweep in, you know, like we've all been through this one before. They're going to repeal everything and everything will be fine. We were sc we've been scammed on this one a million times. I'd love to believe it's true now. I would love nothing more than to come back and say, guys, I was so wrong. I was so wrong when I came to see you last time. But uh, they're going to cut $100 billion from the budget. Wow. Wow. That's like $3 off a trip to the moon. <laughs> Great. Oh my gosh! I think I said that once in some speech. Somebody on Facebook devised an actual coupon with an astronaut. Save three dollars! Act now! Big savings! All right, so we've got this big, this big problem. It's a problem that's come to the point where even, it's not just like our people, it's not just Peter Schiff, it's not just Jim Rogers, it's not the usual names. It's also names we never hear, like, like Lawrence Koklikoff of, of uh, I think Boston University. Now he's a Democrat, he's an establishment guy, and here's what he says. We have 78 million baby boomers who, when fully retired, will collect benefits from Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid that on average exceed per capita GDP. The annual cost of these entitlements will total about $4 trillion in today's dollars, so it's an annual. Yes, our economy will be bigger in 20 years, but not big enough to handle this size load year after year. And he goes on to say, this is what happens when you run a massive Ponzi scheme for six decades straight, taking ever larger resources from the young and giving them to the old, while promising the young their eventual turn at passing the generational buck. Wow, when, when a Democrat mainstream BU economist says it's a Ponzi scheme, like, this is out in the open now. This is, it's gone mainstream. And this is all going to come to an end, he says, in a very nasty manner. The first possibility is massive benefit cuts visited on the baby boomers in retirement. The second is astronomical tax increases that leave the young with little incentive to work and save. And the third is the government simply printing vast quantities of money to cover its bills. Well, why couldn't it be all three of those? It seems quite possible. And then we're seeing the aging of the population. This is a serious issue. Now, it's not that we regret that we're able to enjoy longer lives. That's not the problem. That's great that we're able to enjoy longer lives, but nobody's making any provision for the health care costs associated with it. And it's, it's many, many, many times more costs associated with uh, the so-called old olds, what uh, demographers call people between 66 and 85. We find that by 2050, the number of people over age 100 in the U.S. will have increased by 13 times. And then we look at all these other figures whereby uh, the number of people aged 80 will outnumber children under age 5. That's never happened in U.S. history. Uh, we have a, a situation in which uh, in 1940 we had more college-aged kids than we had seniors. Uh, by 2040 we're going to have uh, the number of senior citizens multiplying by 7 times. 75 million to 20 million college-age kids. How is this going to be taken care of? No one is answering the question. If it comes up, everybody just says, hey, look the other way, and they run away. We, we, get, we get no answer. But we need answers, because who's going to be paying for this? The young people who are going to be struggling their whole lives, working and working and working, harder and harder and harder, just to stand still, 
in order to prop up a system that's obviously going to collapse anyway. I mean, this is, this is their fate. There's nothing they can do about this. They're stuck in this. There's nothing we can do. There's no other way we can care for each other other than by loading greater and greater obligations on, on ever more future generations. There's no other way to, to, to do this. There's no way to tax our way out of this uh, because the tax rates would have to be raised so high the economy would be destroyed. And plus, ever since 1950, we've seen that no matter what the tax rate is, the tax receipts have rarely exceeded 20% of GDP. This is like some kind of fixed ceiling, political, economic fixed ceiling. And so no matter what you do with taxes, there's just a limit, and you're not going to get more than that. So that is not a way out. You could destroy the currency, and we, could, we would have a civil unrest. It would be unthinkable in a modern economy to see hyperinflation. It would be absolutely unthinkable. But yet, this, is, this isn't even being talked about. It's all, all what we get on TV is all just trivialities. It's all trivialities, one after the other. And we won't even bother going into what's going on in the states. Oh, good grief. we got like seven states whose um, pension funds are about to go bust by 2020. We've got another 13 states that are going to go bust in 2025. And they're going to go bust in, in those years, assuming that they're making an 8% return every year between now and then. So they're obviously going to go bust far sooner than that. My favorite scheme was New York City. The, the governor supported a plan that would bail out the pension fund by borrowing from the pension fund. <laughs> I mean, th that's it. I mean, we're dead from the neck up. Like we, th there are no solutions being proposed. So what do we do about this? We are on, on the edge of a major default simply because we believe for years and years and years that, some, that every year, basically as Gary Norris says, every year society will just be the same as it was last year, give or take three or four percent. The idea of a default never enters into the picture. The idea that a Detroit that is a living example of regulation and spending and politics no one, no one saw the total collapse of Detroit. But here's a place where the height of the housing boom Median house price, $98,000. Then, a couple years ago, it, it dropped. It dropped to $14,500. You think, oh my gosh, it hit rock bottom. No, it didn't. The next year, it was down to $7,000. 25% of the schools are closing. The money is gone. People are fleeing. Nothing like this has ever been seen in a U.S. city. And, and in comparison with the scale of the collapse, it was unreported, basically unreported. Is that a microcosm of our future? Well. Maybe because of the situation that our wise overlords that we've had superstitious confidence in and superstitious reverence for have put us in. Our, our, our kids and our neighbors and friends have been waving incense in front of these people for decades, thinking there's no problem they can't solve, there's no problem that raising taxes 10% can't solve, and yet here we are staring at face to face. So what do we do? Well, that's a separate issue. That's what my, my book that's coming out on February 7th called Rollback. It is sort of about, at the end I give some recommendations. Um, but you know, you, you give recommendations knowing that all the recommendations that would actually work will be dismissed as unrealistic. E even though not adopting them is what's unrealistic. Uh, but for now, what my purpose was just to show that by falling for these myths, by falling into these traps, we uh, I don't want to say we, they, they have gotten us into this pickle that it's very hard to get out of. Um, we can get out of it in various ways if we're willing to make great sacrifices in the present. And we're willing to adopt, uh, we're willing to return to a, an era in which we cared for each other. Instead of just pawning off people on, on government bureaucracies, which we looked out for each other. And we treated each other like human beings, humanely. We have to get rid of the smiley face version of government that we were all taught in sixth grade, banish and discard that forever. And we have to likewise take the devil horns off the free market if we're going to have any choice. We need to become knowledgeable. And one tool that I devised to help people with that, people who are busy, they have a million things to do, is I, I, I bought the domain learnaustrianeconomics.com. Easy way to learn all this stuff for free and on your iPod, whatever, so that we can be a formidable force. That, you know, they, yeah, they can fool some people, but there'll be fewer and fewer people they can fool. That's very important. But Frederick Bastiat, one of the great heroes of the last couple centuries, the New York Times derisively said the Tea Party people are reading Frederick Bastiat. Oh, how terrible. But he was a great French economist. And he said that basically what, we are, what goes on with the state is just mutual legal plunder. 
where it would be, it would, I'd be arrested if I went up and stole your money and gave it to somebody else. I'd be arrested for that. But if somebody asked the government to do it, the government got in the ribs, then that's somehow morally different, and that's okay. And he says, you know what the state is? The state is the great fiction by which everyone attempts to live at the expense of everyone else. That's the greatest fiction of all. And it's coming undone. We've all been taught to take. The farmers have been taught to take. The industrialists take. The rich take. The poor take. The middle class take. But where are they taking from? Themselves. What are they doing? With, with quite a big cut taken from the federal government, you know, whose, whose welfare programs eat, are eating up two thirds of them, 70% eating up in bureaucracy. That's what's coming undone. But it is a libel on the human race to say this is the only way or the best way that we can interact with each other. That we can't improve our condition or that of the least among us without the government gun in the ribs. We've gotten to a point where we're going to have to, not for ideological or philosophical reasons, but for eminently practical ones, we're going to have to put the guns down and treat each other humanely, treat each other like human beings, interacting voluntarily. That is all the free market is, and that would be the first step toward genuine change we can believe in.